and it, it is refreshing. It's the signals of good things to happen. It signals to signals of good things to happen from the meeting. From the meeting, obviously, because uh, if you had a position where um, it, it, it was very difficult for government to do what they are doing now, the backing down, and for Labour also to show commitment. Obviously, we also have to do some shiftings in order to bring us to a conclusion. Um, well, we we'll say there have been a fundamental shift of both positions, and we've made such a tremendous and monumental uh, progress. We believe reconverging again on Tuesday, that is coming Tuesday, we should be able possibly maybe be drawing conclusions on these particular negotiations. Some considerations ought to be made by both sides as we are going to concourse. They are going to consult. We are equally also going to look the considerations with our larger body. But from where we are as labor and with the experience we have, we believe we are getting closer to the issues on hand than before. If we, if we say we are getting closer to the issue at hand before, from generally from the start of this uh, process, how has it fared for you, looking at today's crucial meeting with government? Well, the admission from government side to say that they are not oblivious of the cry of the Ghanaian populace and the stance of labor, and for them also to have exhibited that this is a social democrat in our government who is willing to, I mean, picked up with compassion with the Christ and suffering of the masses of this country. Obviously, that is an eye-opener. Together with the uh, detailed explanation supported with figures as to what is happening to the economy right now, especially with the issue of the doom so if we really don't want to see it resonating again, okay, that actually pushed Labour also to uh, have a second look on our stance that actually we took. I'm sure at this point you would confidently say that at least the demonstration yesterday was what propelled government to, to shift its stance now. Indeed, greatly it has paid off because if these stance were expressed in our earlier meetings, I don't think the demonstration will have come on at all. So we are hoping that by Tuesday we should be making some headway with regards to this negotiation. Well, we are very hopeful, but it will all depend whether or not government is also coming with a posture that will shift a little bit from where they are today. Okay, so you are hoping that by Tuesday government will make another move again? Sure. Oh, I see. And obviously, we will also make some shift because where we are and where they are, there should be some additional shifts. Compromise. Yes, okay. some additional shift to at least at the end of the day. Um, uh, as the fear is about this our doom so situation because everything is zero on that if they don't get the required revenue. Okay, to sustain the Dumso element. Then it's like we'll be going back to square one. Then the fear of losing job, the fear of our theater lives going off, the fear of you know banks not having even confidence in the system and so on and so forth. So Labour now is also going to look at this particular you know moral elements and structural elements of the economy and be able to take a decision that to keep Ghana going. All right, so uh, organized labor has essentially backed down on some of its demands regarding recent hikes in utility and petroleum taxes after a marathon negotiation with government on Thursday. Labor had demanded a 50% reduction in utility tariffs and the scrapping of special levies on petroleum products. Details of that agreement are yet to be made public, but General Secretary of the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, Solomon Kote, as you heard there, uh, says that there have been monumental progress in the negotiation process. Why are we not in on the very little details of this? We'll be speaking to Mr. Austin Game, who is a labor consultant uh, via S Skype in a bit. My guest in studio, though, very much seated, Mr. Richard Kwashigar is MP for Keta constituency in the Volta region, and he sits on the Communications and the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament. Good morning to you, Honorable Kwashigar. Good morning. Mm. We, we will talk about uh, PAC's sittings yesterday as well. Uh, but let's start with Labour. Uh, there was a demonstration, there was an earlier meeting, and then there was another meeting yesterday. Thankfully, they say we are somewhere, but we don't know the where that we are right now. Uh, are you hopeful that no further actions will be taken in terms of a strike or further demonstrations? Well, I think that uh, having listened to uh, the labor uh, bosses uh, or leaders, um, one would say that we are getting to a very refreshing point as far as uh, the agitations um, are concerned. 
And uh, the fact is that they have clearly understood each other government and uh, the labor leaders. And um, what is most crucially important is Ghana moving forward in the right direction and having dialogue. And that's, that's the beauty of it, negotiations, dialogue should always be the way out, you know, of any um, differences that we have. And as a result of an intensive um, negotiations and dialogue, um, some progress has been made. They have understood the issues. They have clearly come to that realization that, um, you know, asking that all these levies be scrapped and all uh, will only mean the economy crashing along the line. I don't, I believe strongly that we are at a point, especially taking into cognizance the energy crisis that we have on hand, uh, that if these, some of these desperate measures are not taken, you know, then they definitely this economy will grind to a halt. What it means, therefore, is that um, energy, the energy situation, the power that we're having, which obviously has stabilized after a very long period of uh, what you can call uh, within our balance, doom so, you know, uh, would rather deepen if some of these measures are not put in place. And I believe strongly that every Ghanaian are very much now used to the use of power. Uh, and that obviously is what is driving our economy, you know, and um, if we cannot get monies uh, <laughs> from anywhere else, you know, to, to really hold the economy together, we should be able to get the money from ourselves. And I believe strongly that uh, the economies that oftentimes give us bailouts or support, uh, they raise the monies from within. And we have to raise the money also from within as mm -hmm. much as uh, it is necessary, you know, to keep the economy together to keep uh, government agenda, uh, you know, uh, in, in focus in order to also give us the needed infrastructure that we're talking about. I believe strongly that uh, many of us are very excited about uh, what is going on at SECA, the flyover and all, uh, the good road networks that are being constructed all over the country. We are all enjoying them. Uh, and, and I believe strongly that it takes money to actually put these things in place. Are we not using DUMSO or the energy crisis in particular to unnecessarily bedding the same people who pay these same taxes? Because what you're doing really is not widening the tax nets. You are, it's the same people that you're burdening all over again. And that's why we're feeling it. Well, thank you very much. I think that, um, yeah, you, you, you may have a point, but the, the fact is that efforts also are being made and have been made to widen the task net. Um, if you listen to those who are in charge, the GRE uh, bosses and all, you realize that constant efforts have been made, you know, to uh, rake in those who keep evading um, uh, tax, uh, paying of tax and all. Mm -hmm. I know that some time back it was said that um, about six million Ghanaians are supposed to be within the tax bracket to be paying tax, but about only two million and those that are paying. But then again, also, you would realize that a lot of efforts have been made, you know, in the last year, you know, to, you know, correct that anomaly, bringing in a lot more people to pay tax. But that even may still not be enough, you know, to really address the kind of challenges that we have as a nation today. And, you know, like they say, the Muslim goes, desperate situations cause for desperate measures. So I must, I would say, as an individual, that we are in a desperate situation the reason for which it becomes necessary to take desperate measures, you know, to address uh, or forestall the kind of um, 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 very desperate situations that we are envisaging, you know, uh, before it, 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 it hits us in the face. Mm. You know, um, and I think that uh, if you are a person and you don't have foresight, you know, you, you don't anticipate what is going to happen tomorrow and you don't take some drastic measures today to address it, you're going to have a problem. And I believe strongly that the labor leaders, uh, you know, haven't been exposed to all the challenges that we have as of now, and the consequences of not, you know, collecting more taxes from the Ghanaian people uh, have been laid, laid bare to them. The reason for which they have backed down, the but, reason for but, which... But this they, is not they, a typical NDC ideology, is it, uh, to keep taxing the people? When you say a typical NDC ideology, we're looking at the things that you believe in. Yeah, yeah of course. I the mean, things, you're a social the, the democratic. The NDC is a, 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 um, 
a, a welfare party, to say, to, to, to put that way. It believes in welfareism. It believes in, um, you know, um, the welfare of the people. And I don't think that the NDC has actually um, sidetracked that or has moved away from that. The NDC still believes in that. But again, when you are in a certain situation, you do not hold on to a very Ethiopian um, um, uh, uh, um, scenario, you know, believing that because I think that I say that I am this, if there are very crucial situations that will require taking some, some measures, you know, to address the situation temporarily, you will not do it. I mean, that, that, that would not be wise. You know, so yes, the NDC it believes in the welfare of the people, and it is that belief in the welfare of the people that is even compelling the NDC-led administration. This is government. I don't even want us to talk about NDC. You know, the government is compelled to take these measures in the interest of the people. In the interest of the people because if we do not have power, what it means, therefore, is that our industries will continue to grind to a halt. Jobs will suffer. More jobs will be lost. More people will be unemployed. I'm sure that it would, it would have gotten to a point where uh, TV news would also virtually close down because you may not have the capacity to continue to run on fuel uh, uh, generators and all, which will obviously cost you a lot more. You know, so if the measures that government ought to take you know, to remedy the situations will require that um, more, some taxes be imposed on the people, uh, which I believe um, uh, will help improve the system, why not? And I think the, the, the right steps have been taken by government. Labor understands the situation clearly now. And I think probably what we have been failing at as a people is that con constant dialogue, you know, for each, for each group to, to really be convinced and um, f come face to face with the reality. You know, that this will be the consequences if we don't do A, B, C, D. Mm. You know, and I believe strongly that um, when VAT was introduced, the attitude today was not too different from the attitude at the time. So you it think led, this will just pass? Sorry? This will come and pass. It will come and pass. And it will, the, the dividends will become very obvious for all to see, and people will um, subsequently look back uh, with nostalgic feelings that, wow. This was the way we went about things at the time, and etc. But it has yielded um, some uh, positive uh, dividends. Today, we, we are all benef beneficiaries of that because it's obviously supporting the economy in diverse ways. Get Fund, when it was also incorporated, it's benefiting um, our educational sector in diverse ways. You know, National Health Insurance Levy, when it, it was incorporated into um, um, uh, the tax net. Is benefiting us today and etc. And I believe strongly that the energy levy obviously is also going to galvanize the forward march of our uh, society and our development. Not probably today, but um, a few years to come when probably Mama V would have added 10 years uh, to, uh, to her age and some of us may be uh, gradually approaching the retiring age. You know, so I, I definitely believe that um, um, it's apt and um, we just have to brace ourselves for it. Sometimes we attach a lot of emotions to situations, and that is what makes the whole environment to be very confusing, you know, because obviously some people want to take some advantage of it. Uh, there are diverse interests. There are political interests, and some people would, uh, with political interests will know too well that, look, this is the way to go. These measures that have been adopted at this time are appropriate, you know, for uh, national development, but because it can serve our parochial political interests. Why not we take advantage of it? Why not we pollute the whole atmosphere if you confuse the people? What, then there's a margin that says if you, cannot, if you cannot convince the people, what you do is you confuse them. So uh, if others want to take advantage of some situation and they know they cannot convince people with facts, what they need to do is to confuse them. And probably a bit of that is also uh, really you know, creating some Tension in the but what system. is what is factual though is you buying a hundred CDs uh, worth of electricity in terms of credits and you going home and that running out in five days or ten days not taking you through uh, the number of days that you are used to in the past. Uh, what has been agreed specifically because the the issue is is different leadership of Labour going to agree on something? Initially, we knew government was proposing. 
54% for the utilities, and they still insisted, no, they wanted 50%. It's different if Labour leadership agrees on, on those details. And the general public, because if you look at people who are crying, who are saying, I buy electricity and in no time it runs out, that's reality on the ground. Those people may not be satisfied. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I share that sentiment, and uh, I obviously... I'm a victim too, uh, but what I would want to say is that um, sometimes these are uh, some uh, challenges that we have to take up with the ECG, uh, because for instance, if I buy 100 Ghana cities worth of uh, power, and it's expected to take me for this period, and then within a short time, um, it runs out, it probably means that there, mu there might be some problem with their system. So it may be a systemic failure and not necessarily a policy failure. You know, so we will have a policy that this is the way to go. But then in the execution or the implementation of some of these policies by the various uh, agencies and etc. like ECG, uh, there may be failures. And that is what we ought uh, to address. Then it's up for us to take on ECG and etc. You know, uh, because... Um, it means they have to address that inefficiency, to put it that way. And so there are two sides to the issue. I mean, um, government policy, labor obviously had gone on a certain principle with government to negotiate and some agreement or understanding had been reached. But then the implementation by the various agencies, because I understand that it's not only happening with um, electricity, but even water. Mm. You know, so these are... Uh, areas that the various sector heads or the institutional heads and et cetera will have to address. And that is why sometimes it would even be necessary, you know, uh, public accounts committee, uh, obviously this time we do uh, performance audit, you know, to hold some of these agencies before us when the Auditor General's report captures some of these things. You know, to well, really grill them. To which I would say, to what end? You grilled them, fantastic. No, no, yeah, you grilled them. GRA boss appeared, you grilled him. Details, uh, uh, things came out that we were so proud of, but in the end, what? Oh, in the end, what? I can tell you for a fact that in the end, there are, there are improvements. For instance, yesterday we had um, the, minist the Ministry of Health before Public Accounts Committee. Uh, because there were infractions as far as per the Auditor General's report. And, um, but when we look at the infractions in 2011, it was voluminous. It cut across all these um, uh, agencies under the Ministry of Health. But you realize that in 2010, uh, in 2012, drastic reductions in the infractions, the irregularities, the embezzlement, and et cetera, had reduced drastically. And then in 2013, I mean, what we had was very minimal as compared to the previous time. What that means, therefore, is that some degree of efficiency is beginning to be injected into um, the performance uh, of the uh, various agencies under the Ministry of Health. Okay, so. If you say to what end mm -hmm. and what, that is what it is. Some improvements have been realized. W was the improvement this time around uh, this year better than the previous year? No, we, this, which year? This year, mm -hmm. 2016. Well, of course, 2016, the auditors have not even... Because you're, you're doing the work of 2015, so that's what well, I no, mean. No, 2015... What, you, what you're doing, doing now... No, no, what we're doing is 2011 to 2013. You know, some of these reports are largely oftentimes in arrears. Mm. You know, so we, that is what we are dealing with currently, okay. 2011 to 2013. What it means, therefore, is that previously uh, uh, we had dealt with um, 2009, 2010. You like know, two, three years on. Two, two, three years on. You know, but we are trying to deal with the backlog such that we can be looking at these reports in real time. You know, uh, but I think that um, uh, it has been very revealing. And obviously, if you are in a particular sector and there are infractions against you, uh, you've been heard before public account hearing, which is live on TV. More or less, it's like naming and shaming. It serves as um, 
a warning to others. So it's an effective check. But those things don't bring back the monies that we've lost. No, it oftentimes do. Uh, if if, uh, if I were, my memory will serve me right, last year when we dealt with the secondary schools, you know, there were instances where we recommended outright arrest and prosecution of, it was a recommendation that we did actually because we didn't have the powers um, um, to, you know, arrest people. Um, monies were retrieved. PAC retrieved over, in essence of 200 million to the state. People went out and paid outrightly and etc. And this time around, when there are even infractions against you, for instance, if there, there were supposed to be uh, monies that uh, an institution was to have transferred into the consolidated fund and they're holding on to it, mm. when, they are, they, they, when they receive our letters to appear before PAC, they quickly make sure they uh, do the right thing before coming before us. You know, so you realize from the reports that um, the auditors will confirm that uh, this institution has now actually taken measures to correct the anomaly. Mm. But when you look Does at the date... Does it come with interest? Because if I was supposed to yeah. pay a certain amount into the consolidated fund in, 20, in 2010 or 2011, and I didn't do that at the time, I may have invested the money. If you ask me to refund that same amount today... I probably made a lot of profit on it. Absolutely. Those are some of the challenges that we have in the system. For instance, um, an institution holds onto man petroleum revenue mm. that should have um, been lodged in the consolidated account two, three years. If it's a bank, let's say it's a, a bank, they may have been trading with that money and they, may have, they might have made profits. You the, have a you have a classical case like that. Yes, yes, yes. You know, um, there are punitive measures in place per our laws, but the usual Ghanaian attitude of oh, "let it be," you know. So is that people, how you're treating this current one with? The uh, well, no, no, no. Park Park is very strict on, you know, some punitive measures being taken you realize that a lot of the institutions do not take punitive measures against um, um, officials that have erred. Okay, sometimes they would only compel them to uh, pay the money back without any interest. No action ha would have been taken against the individual. For instance, there was, there's this case in Keta, you know, Keta um, um, uh, Hospital, where mm -hmm. somebody embezzled an accountant embezzled 576,000 Ghana cities. This thing was detected. They went to court. The man is still working a free man. After how many years? From 2011, he's still working a free man. You know? And his assistant, who also embezzled 35,000 Ghana cities, is now in another secondary school as a bezer. The actions that ought to be taken are really not being taken. What it means, therefore, is that because the punitive measures that ought to be applied, the sanctions that ought to be applied, are not being applied, you know, it allows for perpetuation, perpetuation of these things, you know. So we, we really so need to look at that. So who do we blame? Who do we blame? The, the, the entire system. I, I, I mean, the entire we, system. we have to be able to zero in on a particular institution. Because you take the books, yeah, and you do the interrogation, yeah. yeah that is why you come up with all these things. Yesterday, for instance, um, the um, director general of Ghana Health Service came under a lot of fire because, if, for instance, um, let's say uh, the nursing training schools, you know, sold application forms, collected the monies, and they were supposed to have transferred those monies. And they kept those monies because probably they claimed that they didn't have enough money to run. But then if you didn't have enough money to run your institution, and these monies that are not yours have come to, uh, 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 to you, and you want to even use part of it, you must seek some clearance. Mm -hmm. But these things are not done. And it's an infraction. The, uh, the financial administration uh, regulation, obviously having it punitive measures for such behaviors. But these things are not invoked, you know, and we treat these things with uh, kid gloves. But wouldn't you put and the blame at the doors of the ministry? 
Well, you see, again also, I think that when there is lack of effective monitoring supervision, these things happen. You may put some blame, lay some blame at the doorsteps of the ministry. But when you have a large ministry uh, like Ministry of Health with so many agencies, you know, and the various institutions that ought to be talking to each, the, each other are not doing so. You know, these things will happen on the blind side of some superior officers. What it therefore means is that people are not really doing their work effectively. Mm. You know, and so they ought to take some blame. Ultimate responsibility lies with um, uh, um, the one or the head. Mm. You know. But I, I was also just going to say that if you also keep changing the head, then that person would definitely not be aware of most of the issues within that sector. Of course, of course. We've had a lot of such situations um, where, for instance, um, uh, somebody comes in and says that this happened in 2012 and I took over in 2013. Mm -hmm. You know, but the fact is that when you inherit an office, you inherit the assets and the liabilities. So when you take over that office and you realize that there are lapses, you definitely will go through the books. You must also be seen to have taken some measures to correct those lapses. You wouldn't say, well, it happened at the time I was not in office. So therefore, I don't take the blame. But I'm sure that if the one who was there before you came in had done a very good job, and there were lots of resources available, you would definitely um, take the glories at the end of the day. You know, so that, that is what it is. But haven't taken, uh, uh, wedged into uh, the PAC issues, mm. I think that there is one critical matter that I wish to touch on, if you permit me. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I know you are coming to that. The appearance of Dr. Wampa? Yeah. I mean, that whole melodrama, you know, left me a bit um, wondering. Because first of all, uh, it appeared Dr. Wampa, uh, Dr. Wampa in the public eye today may appear as somebody who is notorious for. He refused to appear before the Public Accounts Committee before, twice or three times, if you like. <laughs> he has no, I wouldn't say he refused. There, was, there have been an occasion that Dr. Wampa appeared before the Public Accounts Committee. But this whole thing that happened this week was misconstrued, let me tell you. First of all, a communication from Public Accounts Committee to the Ministry of Finance requesting the presence of the Accountant General, um, the Minister, and um, GRA boss. And it stated officials of Bank of Ghana. Now, if you say officials of Bank of Ghana, it may not necessarily mean the governor to be present. The governor could come, or other officials who are very familiar with that subject matter may represent the Bank of Ghana. Mm. On that particular day, two officials appeared from Bank of Ghana from the top level. But what triggered the... Um, anger of members was their confession that they were not on top of the issue and that they had um, a very short notice to appear before PAC and um, they didn't come with their um, auditor and et cetera and they wanted to plead for time. And that was when people were like, members were like, where is the governor? Now, as a result of that, sitting was suspended but before we adjourned that particular, on that particular day, the chairman of PAC, Honorable Ajima Menu, indicated that we would want the governor to attend on the committee the following day. But if, for any reason, he cannot, one of his two deputies should represent the bank. So, of course, a lot of members rather wanted the governor. Mm -hmm. But these were the closing statements 
this was the closing statement of the chairman of the of PAC. And so the following day, one of the deputy governors came to represent the bank. Then hell broke loose. Some members did not take kindly to it because they wanted the governor to be present. You know. Um, the deputy minister of finance, uh, Honorable Monacote, explained. Other members also, you know, ref tried to refresh the memories of members. Why it must be admissible for us to take on board the deputy governor because of the, the statement that was made by the chairman of PAC. So we cannot necessarily say that Dr. Wampa refused. You know, and I was taken aback when I sat back and listened to the commentaries on radio and on TV, some TV stations, and read bits and pieces in the media mm. in general. I kept wondering. Or what some of your and committee some, members. What some we, we do have that. I think we played it yesterday. But Fred, please get ready. We can play a couple of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because we, we spoke to uh, Honorable Isaac Isiama, for instance, uh, in, in that conversation. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring, we'll bring back yeah, that again, to you. But again. It's, it's interesting the angle that you're bringing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, 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 those are the bare facts. But this was really important for Dr. Wampat, you know, to have been present. He didn't I mean, find it, 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 it absolutely was, necessary. It, it's not a matter of he didn't find it absolutely necessary. Did the deputy governor I, I, answer I, I am, the questions I, I am not here to, to the best brief. of the bank's ability to you? I, I am not here to hold brief for anybody. But I'm only trying to put out there the, uh, my concern of how issues could easily get twisted in the media mm. and how hard-won reputations could easily be maligned if you are not careful. Okay. You know. Let, let me bring you a playback of this one. Uh, we didn't twist anything. We reported what was said. So here we go. This country. Nobody can declare an invitation from a committee of parliament. So, more so when you are entrusted with public funds, somebody, you are a public officer, you are there for the good of this country. So, you cannot, under any circumstance, decline an invitation from parliament of Ghana. The moment you do that, then we are compelled to summon you and to spin you, which may happen very soon. On several occasions, I think it's only once that we have seen the governor here. And yearly, we deal with the other side uh, reports, many, many reports. Some involve the work of uh, uh, Bank of Ghana and other bodies. So when it comes to your turn and you refuse an invitation from Public Accounts Committee, you are insulting the whole country. We are here for Ghana. So Governor of Bank of Ghana, such a sensitive position, such a key function in our monetary system, such a key player in our financial governance system, shall we have a hearing in the Bank of Ghana and the man will be absent. Never. It will never happen again. That we are going to insist that he appears before us anytime there's a public hearing. He is answerable to people of this country and he must understand and understand that if it's too hot for him over there, he can take a decision. But so far as we are concerned, making sure that we provide the right scrutiny over the executive and over all other bodies, we will insist on that. This one, it was at the instance of the auditors that GRE realized that the banks hadn't paid in so much money to the tune of 83.3 million Ghana cities. And here is a government coming to parliament every now and then, asking parliament to impose taxes on so many things. And your 83.3 million Ghana cities sits with two banks, and you're not going after it. Where is the challenge coming from, from your own perspective? It's, it, it's all about lack of reconciliation from GRE, Bank of Ghana, and then Ecobank and GCB. And how regular should that be done? Normally, under normal circumstances, your reconciliation should be done monthly. And looking, even looking at the volumes of transactions that go on every day, I think if GRE can 
a weekly reconciliation will avoid some of these things. And the issue is, well, GRA was saying that, well, Ecobank and GCB have paid with interest. It is not about paying with interest. You have an agreement with them. All right, so that's uh, the Honorable Abinor say also... You also had uh, uh, Honorable Isaac Isiama there. I think uh, Honorable Isaac Isiama's own is directly related to yeah. this area that we've got yeah. into yeah. about the governor not appearing before the yeah, yeah, you see, again, there are two sides on PAC. We have the majority of So minority. this is MPP NDC issue again? No, I you see, it it's PAC. Massive. No, I'm saying that there are two sides on PAC. But if uh, all the people that have been interviewed largely, you know, uh, I wouldn't want to look at it from that perspective. But they are opposition members of oh, parliament. Of course, they are all opposition members of parliament. You know, and um, I pack, we as much as possible try to do our work independent of political affiliations. Mm. But the bad truth, you see, I, I also contributed. I also waded into this Dr. Wampa matter mm. when the matter came up. And I intervened that, look, uh, this is what our chairman said. The reason for which we have a deputy governor today. We cannot fault uh, Dr. Wampa whatsoever. We cannot accuse him of um, disrespecting uh, the committee and all. You know, and that was the essence and the reason. And other interventions from the ranking, uh, uh, Honorable Monacote, George Lowe, and etc. The reason for which Members said, well, that, if that is the case. So we went ahead with the deputy governor. You know, and it wasn't as if the de deputy governor was not on top of the issues. You know, there were infractions. There were uh, challenges with reconciliations. There were issues of transfers that were not made at all. You know. So the, the deputy governor satisfied the committee? Yeah, I mean, the... of course. The infractions we all mm. uh, uh, noticed. And it's not a matter of he necessarily satisfying the committee. Where there are gaps, he will admit there are gaps. Where he needed to be pushed to admit there are gaps, he was pushed. You know, and I, I believe strongly that um, uh, those are issues um, uh, which will not have uh, elicited any different answer um, mm. uh, from Dr. Wampa, as was the case with so his So going deputy. forward, I guess if PAC needs Dr. Wampa, they have to... Uh, send him a specific letter requiring his particular no, presence it, before the committee yeah, no, yeah, and if, not a general one. Yeah, if not a general one. Because if you send a communication that says that officials of Bank of Ghana mm. and then subsequently uh, you said in, in, in a, a rehearsed um, manner, you say the de governor or one of his deputies. Mm. And if the governor does not turn up, he sends his one of his deputies and then head, head breaks loose, then probably... Others will sit, some, sit back and say, look, there may be some mischief somewhere. Mm. So finally on this, would you still as a committee need the presence of Dr. Wapa? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have indicated that, that in the future we would need uh, him along the line. Okay. At the appropriate time, uh, communication will be sent to him. And I know he will, I'm very convinced that uh, he, he, he will definitely honor it. After okay. all, if the finance minister um, um, is asked to attend on the committee, and he, he does. Why would he not? Okay. The GRA boss was there, you know, and on um, all Alex yesterday when he when he came, he came with all the uh, people that are needed, mm. and so sometimes it's better communication. Okay. You know. All right. So it must not be based on an individual or a few people's desire. That it must have been this person. Okay. Without um, reg uh, regard to. What communication was sent out? All right. On that note, I am grateful that you could make it here. Thank you so Thank very, you very much. much. Thank you very um, much. Uh, Honorable Richard Koshiga is member of parliament for Kata constituency uh, and also spoke to us on matters of the Public Accounts Committee because he's a member of that committee. Thank you for watching AM Talk. Up next, we'll bring you entertainment. Etel brings us entertainment this morning here on the AM Show.